All righty. And that was the, the very first talk of the API security track. We are really excited to keep going here. Um, we have a, one, a number of wonderful sponsors. So if you haven't had a chance to check out their virtual booths, download their white papers and all their collateral, uh, please, please do so. Um, we, we really appreciate these sponsors. This conference does not happen without, without their support. Um, coming up next is the co-founder and CTO of Screen. Hey, hey JB, how are you? Oh, might be on mute. I'm great. Thank you, Tyler. Yeah, firstly, I wanted to say congrats on the, the acquisition a few months back. Um, it's great to see that uh, that one happen. And I've been following Screen since you guys surfaced from Stealth years ago. So um, uh, great to see the success and really excited to hear you speak about this, this word, this acronym that is RASP, right? It means so many different things to so many different people. And so um, myself and I'm sure so many people in the audience are excited to kind of better understand what that means and how that can protect their APIs today. Thank you, Tyler. I hope this will bring some answers and we're also extremely excited uh, after the acquisition about all the new doors that this unlocks for the, for the world of security. And I'm happy to, to share a bit more about that tonight. Uh, thanks so much, JB. Cheers. Hello everyone. So, as Tyler said, I'm JB, CTO and co-founder at uh, at Screen, uh, acquired by Datadog. Now I'm a Datadog AppSec engineer. Previously, I was in the Apple Red team. I've done pen testing on so many different um, Apple products, operating systems, uh, and just platforms where Apple is built in. Um, the I also pentested so many different companies. Uh, I'm the host of the AppSec Builders uh, podcast. Feel free to to take a look. So today we we're here to talk about um, API security, and so you know RASP, the the, the acronym, uh, runtime application security protection, runtime application self protection. Sorry. Um, so. Yes, that's that's the context, right? We're talking about securing productions. And so if you think in terms of um, how what it means for security, uh, production is the right of shift left, right? So that's, that's a strange way to put it. But let's look at uh, how shifting security left is uh, somehow a dangerous oversimplification. Um, so shifting left uh, means that you, you shift left from what? You shift left from the legacy pattern, right? The one that was working in the, in the 90s, in the early 2000s, where the security testing was only happening at the time of release, right? So before the release, basically, no one mentioned security ever, basically. And the paradigm of shift left means, yeah, we want now instead of doing security there, to move it on the left where um, the development happens, the design happens, right? So that's that's great and, and that's required, right? To have security there. Um, but sh sh should, that, should it be only here? Um, I'm not sure because like shift security left is like saying, well, just imagine you are building your house. Um, shift left would ensure that you have a great blueprints for your house and the people building it are trained from a security standpoint. So yes, it will be very solid, but it doesn't mean that once it's built, you will not check your alarm systems or you will not check your keys, right? So what you want to do actually is not shift left. It's also shift left. And so if we take a look at the vendor space, are all of those vendors left? No. So are they wrong? No, they're not, right? They are just securing other parts than the left of the software development lifecycle. So what we want is not shift left. What we want is shift everywhere, right? And so the way we could see that is that what we need is an observability system that is gathering information from everywhere, from the left, of course, but also from the right. 
you want to ensure that nobody is actually attacking successfully or not your application, right? You want to also ensure that your developers are pushing code that guarantees your security requirements and are using the right tools and the right processes. So you need to observe all of that. Saying that security can happen only on one way or on the other is an oversimplification. So if we try to imagine the ideal system of security, what can we imagine that would operate at uh, this level, right? At the operate and monitor level. What ideal system could we build? So the first thing you want to do is to collect security events, right? Things that happen and that are security tainted. So for instance, attack detection, right? The simple and pattern based. It's basic, but it's the first hint. Then obviously you would like to have advanced vulnerability detection. When vulnerability is triggered in my production, then I want to know. But also you want to have actor detection, like the user reputation. Is this user known malicious or known sensitive? Is it an admin? Is it just a new user? On the other hand, the IP reputation is the actor performing an attack um, known in a threat intelligence service or in my service history. And of course, business logic abuse, like account takeover, feature abuse, or, or unusual behaviors. Those are all the things that you want to monitor. That's the security tainted bits, right? But obviously you don't only want that. If you assume that you can monitor entirely the production phase, then what else do you want to have? The routes, right? You want to know if a route attacked is a real route, is a route that is sensitive or not. Obviously, authentication and authorization is critical to understand the context of a given request. Your application dependencies. You want to know if someone trying to find, I don't know, um, a PHP vulnerability in your application is actually targeting a PHP application or not. You want to know what are the data stores connected to your app, the connected services, what the code running is doing. Is it accessing data stores as it syncs outputs? And obviously, what are the source code repositories attached and uh, making this application possible? Okay, so <laughs> that's a lot of information, right? Um, that's How does that help us? How can we improve API security thanks to that information. So let's take a step back, right? What do we actually need? You know that as well as I do, security resources are scarce. It's hard to find experts. When you have developers, it's hard to find developers who know security, right? So all of those resources, they are spread thin, monitoring the production, helping developers, maybe their, co their co-workers, design secure systems, and keep up with the business. And on top of that, the systems are becoming more complex, right? So if you think of a security product that would aggregate all of that data, who would have the time to take a look at it? <laughs> Not a single security team that I would be aware of. And I know a lot. So what you want is a security product that make their life easier and help them focus on what matters, right? So how can we compound that information to actually do that? Let's assume that you have an API, okay? And you have all of the traffic that you want to monitor. Your goal will be to get meaningful information about the security activity without false positives, and you want to resurface the threats here, right? So to do that, you will compound the security information with the contextual information, right? So let's assume that we have traditional security tool that only does um, pattern matching 
and can find some uh, security information on the, on the incoming requests. Okay, that's 1% of your traffic. I don't know what's the load of your API, but 1% of the traffic is usually way too much for a single team. So how can we make that better? Well, we can use the contextual information, right? And we can discard the attacks that are not matching an existing route. Okay, good. We keep half of those attacks. Great. What else? Well, uh, maybe we can keep the attacks that are targeting what the code actually does, right? If you have a Go API, you don't care about attacks that would target PHP or Ruby applications, right? So if you do that, you again divide by 10 the amount of events that you want to look at. And what if we were looking at the attacks that are not on edge services, right? The load balancers or the internal application, uh, the external facing applications are usually very, very often attacked, but it's often irrelevant, right? So if we take a step further and look at the services that are internal and that are actually attacked, well, we reduce again the number of events that we want to look at. And that's a very partial and simplified way of how you want to do that. If you imagine those dimensions multiplied by 10 and a tool able to correlate them in order to resurface the events that matters, to group them by actors, then your security information is multiplied by a thousand with checking it a thousand times more. So let's take a look deeper at those events and see how that would be possible, right? So let's assume that we have an attack that is calling a real API endpoint. Well, you can easily check if the route is an actual route from the fr framework, right? If it's not, well, this will be a 404, for instance. And you can find the associated user so you get a lot of information about uh, this attack. Then if the attack is superficial, you can know that by looking at your service map and you can easily find that the service is just after the load balancer, so it's an edge service. What else? Well, if we detected a Cassandra NoSQL injection attack pattern, well, this thing only interests you if you have a Cassandra database in the trace of this attack, right? Here we can find that we have. Then what, what if the attack triggered an exception, right? An exception that was caught, maybe, but that's still very interesting. And so last but not least, we can find that the NoSQL attack that was discovered here is actually stealing user credentials. So we have an actual attack here. That's a lot of information that you can very easily digest and use to resurface the relevant information pieces. So in a nutshell, what, what happened here? We can take a look at all the events, the criticity, and we can see with this oversimplified model, but that should give you the mental picture of what we are trying to do here. So a Cassandra uh, injection attack payload, well, okay. But it calls a real API endpoint, that's interesting. Oh, this endpoint is directly exposed to the internet, so it should see hundreds of thousands of attack per minute. We don't really care, but this endpoint actually performs a Cassandra request that is matching the attack payload and it triggered an exception. And last but not least, we discovered that this attack actually performs a NoSQL injection, stealing user credentials. So that's very high criticity. Here we know we want to trigger a pager. So what do you do then, right? The pager is fine, but do we want to wake up the security team uh, and wait for them to uh, wake up, spend, um, boot their phone and, and, and do whatever they need to? No, we can automatically block the actor performing this attack. Maybe block the vulnerable endpoints. 
maybe we want to share this actionable and code level information with the developers so they will be able to learn about NoSQL injections, but also review their other NoSQL code. And we want, obviously, to closely monitor the other Cassandra queries, and especially the one holding critical information, meaning the one collected to sensitive data stores, right? So that's a holistic and code level API observability. But what's beyond that? You have other key categories of assets on your production that need observability, right? Like the data stores, the data flows, the data volumes, how much volume of data is an actor pulling from one service. The data categorization, is that uh, just marketing information or is that the pay slip information? What about the network, the bandwidth, the flows, the system? OS level behavior is critical if you want to see an attacker pivoting or trying to find persistence. And cloud and infrastructure, you have a lot of configuration and changes information that is extremely relevant from a security standpoint. And that's only looking at those two slices of our software development lifecycle, right? So remember, you don't want to shift left, you want to shift everywhere. So the future is crossing the security information with the runtime, with the development, with the testing, with the QA context, right? What's the difference with a regular CM? Well, a CM typically gathers logs with hundreds of integrations logs from traces, from attacks, from your operating system behaviors, from the errors, from the vulnerabilities. Okay, but this is very flat, right? A log is like a line of text, a few kilobytes. It's very helpful if you can create hundreds of them, but what if in the context of security you want to compound that with other information? Well, you need something different, right? You need something that will work on rich events beyond logs. Like traces. A trace is a very complex object, right? Um, with information about the network, about the data stores, about the queues that you have in your systems. And that's the same for all the events that you can notice here. So what what are some takeaways about those thoughts and from what, according to me, is the future of API security and of application security. Well, you don't only shift left, right? You shift everywhere. You want to leverage observability from your overall engineering organization, from development to production, in order to improve the security monitoring. And last but not least, you want to correlate this data using rich and coherent sources of, ever, of information rather than flat and disparate information. Thank you for listening. JB, that was uh, wonderful and insightful, and I feel like you covered so many different things from observability to runtime protection to the importance of kind of like shielding right as we shift left, right? You know, that's that, that big buzzword we, we always hear about. Um, I'm looking to see some questions come in, and, and if you have. So I'm wondering from your perspective, what do you think it will take for there to be more awareness around the need to understand APIs and protect APIs kind of beyond the traditional LAF um, foundations of OAuth and OI, um, OIDC and API gateways, right? Which is what most developers, right? You know, I've, I've gotten my WAF, I have my API gateway, my APIs are secure. Um, and we just know that's not the case. Yes. So if you, if you think about those tools, what they have in common is that they focus on the perimeter, on the edge of your network and of your infrastructure. So it's um, a required level of defense, 
but it's not enough because it produces a lot of noise and you cannot have meaningful information. What we think uh, is needed, and that's uh, what RASP is all about, it's correlating this information with deep encode uh, runtime security information. For instance, um, having something that sits near to your application and that can correlate this information will help you resurface this information. But that's the new category of tool uh, that you need. And you can see that's the direction the industry is converging to. Um, security tools um, are moving from the network inside the application. That's the same thing that happened to performance tools, right? We don't measure performance mm -hmm. on the edge at the API gateway level measuring milliseconds. We measure performance inside the application, actually exposing the database calls and displaying you the end-to-end -end, um, flow of the request. And the same is happening to security. This is what all the APM vendors are building right now. And this is where we believe the security mindset of people will change and we will build tools that will help to bridge the gap between developers and security people because those tools will enable them to take very, very deep look inside their APIs. No, it makes sense. Um, what do you think happens to the whole WAF and next generation WAF market with this evolution of RASP and, and deeper observability? So you, you you still need uh, you still need WAF right because it's um, it's interesting um, if 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 you take the average um, company you have a lot of applications that are live and you have uh, and but that's the tip of the iceberg right that's often where the cruel uh, uh, the crown jewel are, are kept is is what's super important but you have a lot of legacy applications that you cannot very easily deploy or monitor or protect that's a lot of work and for this part of your company it's super important to keep a WAF because a WAF, you just need to add a gateway or reconfigure your DNS. And so easily you can have a layer of protection. It's not the best layer you can think of, but sometimes you cannot uh, afford something else because it's, it's more complex to deploy in legacy environments. No, I think that that's really insightful. There's so many different, um, marketing terms and trends happening in security right now, it's, it's hard to kind of keep track of everything. Um, what else do you, um, what other advice do you have for, you know, kind of CISO orgs as they have so many different competing priorities? I'm not sure how many CISOs are going to be attending API days, but I think it's good for them to kind of hear from, from the experts and what the, the people on the ground, the, the prodsect engineers, the SOC analysts are, are fighting every day in terms of abuse of APIs. Yes, um, obviously the, the, the priorities that you have as a, as a CISO depend enormously on uh, the shape of your company and what it's doing from a security, uh, from a, sorry, from a technology standpoint. But let's assume that I guess as most uh, API days um, watchers, uh, you are in a company that is actually building APIs. Then you want to ensure that uh, your APIs are safe end to end, right? And it starts with the design phase, you want to ensure that um, you have some security culture that is spread out across your developers. And so you need to um, evaluate holistically what are the weak points in your development process. And that goes from writing the code, even before that, designing an API and ensuring about their requirements down to operating your API in production. And that's a very good question, right? Well, what is what is the strategy that a CISO could um, should develop? There is not a single answer, and there is not either a simple answer. Otherwise, uh, that that would be a very simple job, and I don't think it is. Um, but so, from uh, a pure API and um, and monitoring right standpoint, um, my, my belief is that you should. Um, with APIs that are very uh, modern that, and that are yeah. live, you should... Yeah, right at the end, JB. Sorry, oh, sorry to cut you off. Yeah, JB, thank you so much for the time. Appreciate it. Uh, your always of words of wisdom are, are helpful. Thank you. Thank you so much, Tyler. Have a great day. Goodbye. Bye-bye.